Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> and welcome to our Zoom talk this evening. I'm very pleased to welcome as our guest speaker, Patrick Kalea, who is the executive president of Dinard Helwa, which, as you will know, is the Malta equivalent of the English National Trust. Patrick graduated from the University of Malta in architecture and civil engineering in 1989. He has worked on many major projects across the country, uh, such as the Malta International Airport Terminal, restoration the on the extension of Lombard Bank, both in Tower Street and Republic Street, and on many other projects. Over the years, he's campaigned against the degradation of urban conservation areas, both in Malta and in Gozo. Those who are, have known Malta for some time appreciate that while tourism plays a large part in the country's economy, we would not want to see the history of the island destroyed. The Friends of the Letter actively support such projects as the restoration of Villa Freya and have had many talks on its history. We've also visited the site a number of times. Helwa right is Malta's national is Malta's national trust. And as you know, it's a non- or perhaps, you know, it's a non-profit organization that works to protect and preserve important sites, buildings, and landscapes. So basically, we're concerned with two issues. We're concerned with historic buildings and the natural environment, and we look to preserve both. Now, Malta's constitution, there's an article which states that the state shall safeguard the landscape and the historical and artistic patrimony of the nation. However, this doesn't always occur. And there was there have been cases even in the European Court of Justice where they, it was decided that the article in the Constitution doesn't provide for any penalties or consequences if there's non-compliance. So you cannot force the state to look after the whatever the historic buildings or you can lobby for them but you have no there's you there's no means of actually forcing them to do so so that is an issue which means that if the the state priorities differ then you you just end up with um ngos like ours where they they come in to fill in that void. And Malta's National Trust, which is Din Lai Hill, was established in 1965. I think it was very it was one of the very first um NGOs on the island to be formed. It was the founder was a, a judge called Maurice Caruana Karen, whose daughter it happens to be our secretary general at the moment, and she has also been very active over the years. These are, I'm mentioning this for one particular reason, and you'll see, these are letters of congratulations which were sent in 1965 to Din Helwa. The first one on the left was from Lord Mountbatten. The, then there's one from the National Trust, and there's one from Ernel Bradford. But there's also one from, uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, the, um, Quentin Hughes, he was an architect and a historian. He wrote a book about the story of architecture in Malta, and he wrote to the judge, Caruana Karen. And what is important, perhaps, is just this quote here, that he mentions that there are so many historic buildings in Malta, and it's so important, but he also says that because your island is so small, any careless, ill-thought, new building can have a disastrous effect on the finely balanced environment. And it is as important to safeguard the surroundings of historic buildings as to preserve the buildings themselves. And I just want you to bear that in mind that he was, he sort of um, emphasized this fact that it is also important to, to protect the, the surroundings because we tend to suffer quite a lot um, there have been a number of cases recently where the surroundings have been compromised, have compromised actually the historic buildings. I'll come to it a bit later. 
So Din Larsel was a registered voluntary organization. And uh, I mean, it's become quite tough now. And uh, you have to, f there's a lot of bureaucracy around all these NGOs. And uh, and they are very, they are very, um, carefully controlled by the, the state organizations, including the Commissioner for Voluntary Organizations, because there have been a number of issues in the past. Anyway, we are apolitical and non-profit making. We have a statute, an executive committee and a council. We rely exclusively on sponsors and fundraising for all of our projects. And we are audited. So how does what does Din Laritelwa do and how does it operate? So as I said, we are, and it's, it's all voluntary. So we have about 150 volunteers in all with some amazing guardians like Paolo Ferrelli, who you mentioned before, but there are others too who are doing an amazing job. And it was one of the reasons when I started going around the sites, when I was first asked to be, um, the takeover as the executive president. I think it was one of the things that inspired me most was seeing all these volunteers who have dedicated so much time and effort and are doing such a, a wonderful job with all of our sites. Anyway, so we work on a number of fronts. There's the, the most obvious one and well-known one, which is the restoration and guardianship of historic and cultural buildings. So at the moment we have about, well, now we have about 12 or 13 sites which we actually have um, uh, we've signed guardianship deeds so we are obliged to look after them and maintain them and open them up and use them and we also have a committee that vets every single planning de or development application in Malta and Gozo and that is quite a tough job and it takes up a lot of time and also resources from Dinlarit Helwa but it's and it's ongoing we have an educational outreach so we have lectures in, in the office or on sites we give talks we have interviews we write in the papers so various um, outreaches we also at schools we have photographic competitions for children so there's various things we do I'll start off with the histor restoration of historic cultural buildings, of which we have quite a few. This is an old map of Malta, but they are spread all over Malta and Gozo. There are a lot. We are probably more, more well known for towers, but there are a number of other structures which we've restored over the years, like this Sharolla windmill in Zuri, which was done in 1969, actually. There's the Birmiftuh Chapel, which was restored in 1970, which we still have a guardianship deed for. And we hold uh, international music festivals uh, every year. In fact, there's one at the, well, there's been, we've had two concerts in the, over the past three weeks. And there's another concert next week, which unfortunately I'll be missing, but it's a beautiful medieval chapel. And th there are concerts there. So these are just to show you that we put these properties to good use and um, we we hold these these concerts there anyway and they're open up to the public every first Sunday of the month this was a concert we had recently and this is a was a tour on the left hand side you can see the tour and this was a concert we had about two weeks ago we had some French musicians coming over So, oops, sorry. Anyway, that was just a clip just to see what it's like and give it an, uh, an idea of the atmosphere inside the chapel. Um, this is the Winia Court Tower you mentioned before, Anne. And uh, again, we have a guardianship deed for this and it's open quite, quite often. And we have a very good guardian there too, Martin Vella, who's very dedicated we also have reenactments there 
and it is Malta's earliest tower. It was built, it was by Adolf de Winiacourt, and it was one of the first towers, well, actually the first tower built in Malta and goes up by the night. It seems to be slowing down. Okay, these are this was a reenactment we had recently at, at the top of the tower. There have been quite a a lot of groups, reenactment groups that have formed over the years in Malta, and they're all very keen to have, use our sites for their reenactments. This was a tower which was a fountain, sorry, that was restored in Valletta in 1986 which has been shifted location a number of times, sorry. This was the Vedette in Valletta, which was also a symbol of our, well, not this one, but it's a, a symbol of Jim Hell was Vigilo logo. This is the Red Tower, St. Agatha's Tower in Melliha. It's recently gone undergone a, restora a big restoration job, but unfortunately, some of the plaster didn't adhere very well to the to the substrate so we're going we have got a few patches which need to be done up again and it's in process of being restored again so again we've just launched this was recent in february we launched we had a multilingual video launched about the red tower and it's you can actually watch it on on youtube if you're interested and it is, I think, our most popular site. So a substantial amount of our income from the site is received through the Red Tower. And apparently, according to the Malta Tourism Authority, it's the most photographed site in Malta and Gozo. So we're very proud of that. This is the Santa Maria Camino Tower and once again this tower is being restored at the moment we've just transferred the whole lot of scaffolding to Comino to commence restoration works unfortunately it has to be restored in the summer months um, when tourism is sort of at its peak but anyway there's nothing we can do about that it's a problem with a logistical problem with the weather so it's a bit unfortunate, but there's nothing we can do about it. But it's also very popular. This is the state of the Camino, so I'll just give you an idea of what it was like before. This was the Dweira Tower before restoration works were carried out on it, and they were completed, uh, well, they were in, over a number of years, but they were done again recently, and they were finished, they were completed last year again. So it's ongoing. I mean, the, they're all exposed, obviously. But the very nature of these towers is that they're on the coastline, so they're exposed to sea spray, which is very damaging to the stone. And um, as you can see, I mean, the press give us quite, I just cut the, got these clippings from all the paper, from the Times mainly, but just to show you that it's ongoing. So we we actually reach out to the newspapers to sh to publicly show what what works have been done because we depend like i said we depend on sponsors so we have to show that the work is being done and that we need their help and that the properties are being used such as the santa maria tower which was used for the count of monte cristo film some well now a number of years ago but Still very good. We had done some restoration works on the balcony at the Manuel Theatre. So that was quite good. And I think pro possibly our flagship project was the Our Lady of Victory Church in Valletta. This was the very first church built in Valletta. It was possibly the first building that was built in Valletta because it was the first plans date back to the 1566 which is the year after the Great Siege, when they had the Knights had decided to settle in Malta and um, develop Mount Shiberas, which is where Valletta is today. And there's a note on one of the drawings saying the Our Lady of Victory Church and its location. 
it was rebuilt over the years and extended, but this is the church and it had been abandoned for a number of years. And over the past 10 years, it's undergone a really major and professional restoration job. So and the, on the right hand side, you can see the a photograph of what it's like today, but the the we had um, the paintings on the ceiling, which were by an artist called a Maltese artist called Alessio Araldi, were hardly were barely visible. So there was a, a a group from the UK restorers came over and they spent years in Malta doing them up and restoring the ceiling, which is absolutely beautiful today. We this chapel, this church is open. Every, well, practically every day. It's also very popular with um, as a wedding venue, but we also have uh, concerts there for months. Every Tuesday, lunchtime concerts. There'll be just one hour classical concert, or sometimes they've they've, they've got they get some um, guitarists to play. But anyway, it's still very popular. There was also an organ that was restored, an 18th century organ on the thing, which... Anyway, it's basically put to very good use and very popular. These are just some cuttings from the papers just to show that you know, Arcel has actually been restoring all these sites. Another site is the Delimar Lighthouse. We actually have permission to use this property for accommodation purposes. Although it's again, it's so exposed that it's going to. In fact, we've just issued a tender to have the part of two sides of the building restored again because uh, all the joints start popping out after some time. And also, the lens needs rest restoration works. The, these are the restoration works that carried out in 2006, but since then, I've, I've been on I inspected the site and the 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 mechanism on the on the lens and the rotationing and the cog wheels are all need servicing once again besides the building so that was one side of dinlar Tello's work which is really related to the restoration of historic buildings and the other thing that we do is um, the heritage and environment protection. We've got a committee that is dedicated to um, vetting all the planning applications that that are made. We've got some architects who we we employ. We've got two architects who we employ who do do just that, and they go through all the policies and ensure that what is being applied for is within policy and if not we object sometimes we take it to we to an appeals board and if that fails we actually take it to court where the decision is normally final and we have had a number of cases which we won in court unfortunately with the planning authority we haven't had much luck i mean they normally at the moment i think there's this pro-development side to the planning authority that um, is very difficult to break through. But as you can see, we've had, a, we last year, we've had over 1,500 planning ob objections made. As I said before, at the beginning, when uh, Quentin Hughes wrote that letter to Judge Karana Karan about how important it is to, to not only preserve the historic buildings, but also to preserve their surroundings. We had a case recently where somebody applied to build a, a huge block of apartments just meters away from the Gigantia temples in Gozo, which are a World Heritage Site. Anyway, Din Laritello objected to that. We lost the objection. It went to an appeals board. We lost that. And a group of, from Dinar Selwa um, applied to have the permit revoked. And that is not an easy thing to do because you've got to prove that there was either some misleading information in the application or that the planning authority 
misinterpreted something. Anyway, eventually we we got the planning board, which is the highest board at the planning authority, to actually rev they didn't quite revoke it. In fact, I think it's a bit of an issue still that all they did was sent it back to have the plans um, checked once again to check whether it was within a buffer zone for the Chikantia temples. So we're still waiting for the outcome on that. Yes, there's a, also a threat to the Valletta roofscape. So once again, it's not only the buildings, but it's also the context which we're trying to protect. It's also the, the environment, the countryside. We've had a number of applications in areas which are in rural areas where we've come out with campaigns to try to stop these developments. This was a recent um, protest we did in Gozo where the, the state applied to widen the beautiful road leading Victoria to Marsal Farn. And I, th I think it's one of the most beautiful roads in Malta that links two very busy areas through a very serene and tranquil and picturesque valley of Marsal Farns. Anyway, we so we've made a we've protested. We've I met the minister. We've tried to get them to amend the plans. They promised that they'd do it. They haven't yet. So we're still pushing on this. We wrote and I wrote an article in the papers about it because they want to widen this road just to increase the speed. Now, increasing the speed, they said that they'd increase it from about forty to fifty kilometers an hour for a three point seven kilometer journey all it is is about 100 seconds so we can't understand why they want to well we we have our suspicions but why they want to widen it but it's just absolutely crazy that they're going to do this and i've put about 200 trees in the process by the way so these are other projects we work on we had clean up cam campaigns cleaning up the countryside We've also taken over Maestral Park, together with Nature Trust and Ambient Martha, which is a huge um, natural area outside Imjar, and Manikata, which is a beautiful area. Anyway, and we're looking after that. There's an old barracks there, which we're, we're also restoring some of the building to do them up. Um, this is uh, again another thing. The, the, the build, this building, which was built recently, is on the out well, just on the border with the the urban conservation area and Gargul. This building here that you see here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse on the screen, but anyway, this is the actual border with the uh, urban conservation area. The church is just up this this road. So, and this building here, they want to extend this block right around, which will overlook a beautiful garden in the urban conservation area. And we objected to this. Anyway, they, they the planning authority totally completely ignored uh, the objections and came. Sometimes, I mean, it's very depressing to listen to the commission discussing these applications. For example, the extension to this block, which got wraps right around the whole area and will overlook, it's a five-story building, which will overlook a beautiful garden in the urban conservation area. The solution of one of the members of this commission at the planning authority to the architect, his suggestion to the architect of the project was, why don't you have the windows overlooking the garden um, done as arches, like have arches instead of square windows. And that was his suggestion to solve the problem. So again, once again, this is the same thing that Quentin Hughes mentioned. And it's not just our historic buildings, but it's also our urban conservation areas. And this is happening all over Malta and Gozo. So you get these buildings which are being constructed on the outskirts of urban conservation areas. And they are blocking off beautiful vistas, streetscapes, 
um, iconic views of churches, for example, from uh, from distant views. Anyway, it's all very unfortunate. Um, this is a building which went up in, in St. Julian's, for example. I mean, there were two very old buildings, 10th of the century buildings, which were quite historic, and everything around it was, was constructed. And this crass building was given permission just about maybe two years ago to to build over this this sort of neo-gothic building. This is another building which was obviously on top of a, a, a conservation area building, which was given permission, which was, as you can see, done extremely insensitively, to say the least. So these are problems which Dinlar Helwa and Malta are facing um, with the development going on at the moment. And so that's a, this is another case of this chapel, which was given, this block was given permission right next to a chapel, I mean, just adjacent to it, you know, which completely destroys the whole context. And it's very, very sad. As I said, we've had some I wouldn't say luck, but some success, rather, with some decisions, which were taken, though, by the court. So it means we'd have to object, then appeal, and then take it to court if the appeal is not upheld, which is a lengthy process, a very expensive process. And it's all funded by Dinlar Helwa. This is the case I told you about, about the Gigantia, where the courts decided to revoke, well, the planning authority revoked it. Another case where they built, somebody built extra floors on a building and it, and it was re revoked, the permit was revoked by the court. However, the planning authority has just shown itself, proved to be completely toothless. So despite these court decisions, um, judgment saying that the permits have been revoked and that they cannot have it. The buildings are still there, despite writing to the enforcement sections of the planning authority, nothing has been done about them yet. And there have been a number of cases. Um, we have had our problems too, where council members have been bullied or threatened. Um, again, this St. This Ign Ignatius Villa is surrounded, there's an application to build a hotel, a seven-story hotel just next to it, and it borders on five or six grade one scheduled buildings. So this is another ongoing, in fact, the decision is, um, it's going up for decision in about two weeks' time. So it's another delicate case. In fact, I just, it was an, I just published an article about it in the Times of Malta recently. This was an, something which is perhaps a bit more hopeful is that not all architectural projects are of a very of a poor quality. So every year, Dinlar Telwa um, has these architectural heritage awards, and uh, we award architects who we think have done good work and. Uh, I think it's important that we do sh show this positive attitude and hopeful attitude, actually. We also supported the City Gate project, the Renzo Piano project in Valletta, which I think turned out very well. The other thing, as I said, is this education and outreach aspect of the Dinlar Telwa. So, we give lectures at our offices or on sites. We visit schools. We visit. We have obviously the guided tours of some of our properties. Sometimes we visit, like I said, schools. We also publish a, a mag uh, twice a year, bi yearly, biannual magazine, which has just been published now. Um, we've published books about, in this case, Our Lady of Victory. There's a beautiful publication about all the restoration works carried out. And 
other books. Uh, this was by Dr. Stanley Faruja. He's also a, a council member who has worked has worked for years on on most of the projects and has published a number of books about the heritage we've saved. So I think there have been thing, articles in the papers where people have uh, said that Dylan Arcello has made a difference in Malta. So occasionally we get these uh, recognition in the papers. We, the number of visitors had dwindled over COVID, as you can see. So from about 93,000 in, in 2018, it went down to just 5,000 in 2021 because we had to close down. However, last year we had a record number of visitors, over 136,000 visitors, and this year we're expecting more. Um, I don't know if you know, but I had a meeting with the Malta Tourism Authority earlier, um, sorry, late last week, last, last week, and we were told that Malta is expecting to have 3.2 million tourists this year visiting. So, huge number of tourists. So, um, in fact, we were thinking of organizing um, a seminar about our economic model. And uh, obviously, our size is limited, so we can't just keep on expanding and developing. There's a, the, at some point, there has to be a limit. As I said, uh, we're a registered organization and a voluntary non-profit organization, so we rely exclusively on sponsors for and fundraising. So we've had, uh, obviously, like I said, some very generous sponsors like HSBC and PwC and the Alf Mitzi Foundation, Pricewaterhouse have been very good. The Malta Tourism Authority have been, I don't really want to mention them all because I'm, I'm sure I'll leave some out, but there's Atlas Insurance, BOV, APS, who, all these have been fastened. They've all been extremely generous with Din Helwa. And I think Din Helwa has managed to retain a very good reputation locally. So... Although it's an ongoing, I mean, it's a big effort. I, find I spend a lot of my time begging for money for Dinar Telwa now, every week. <laughs> but anyway, it's on. it has to be done. We got some sponsorship from Playmobil, the Mayo, and MTA have sponsored the Melihara Tower again. Maestral Park, we got Corinthia and it's Cameron McIntosh, who's also helping out on the restoration of one of the buildings there. But obviously, like I said, we, we're struggling with some dwindling funds, on, in particular on one of our projects, which is a recent acquisition, a guardianship deal, which we, uh, deed which we just signed. It is for the restoration of what we all have termed the Australian bungalow. I'll get to, I'll speak about it in a few minutes. Din Laratelwa has the president of um, the the Republic as its patron, and uh, we have just received inf confirmation that the new president, um, the notary Miriam Spiteri de Bono, will be uh, has accepted to be our patron once again. Like I said, we just signed eleven guardianship deeds at the end of last year, but we've signed another another one last week one of my the tasks i think which is quite when i visited the properties and one of the things i really wanted to do was to consolidate and maintain the existing properties because all the properties that i've seen that we look after all require some maintenance whether it's consolidation of the fabric the building fabric or even the exhibits they all need some care maintenance and possibly some revamp internally including this white tower we're still it's ongoing with which we've also got for this white tower which is in meliha we've got the permission to use it for accommodation permits uh 
possibilities as a hostel. So that should be quite useful even to earn some income. But we haven't got around to it because we're still waiting for Enamorta to supply us with a three-phase supply of electricity, which hasn't been very forthcoming yet. This is the Maestral Park. Again, these are ongoing at the moment. The Alice has just been completed. Torimamo is ongoing. In fact, the work started today on some of the restoration works on the roof and the walls. This was uh, the chapel that I mentioned before the talk started. It's a medieval chapel on the outskirts of Rabat, which we signed the guardianship deed last week for that. But we had been lobbying to have this medieval chapel for years to look after because it had fallen into a complete ruin. And this Australian bungalow, we've signed the deed for that too recently. And we've started restoration works on it. Basically, the Australian bungalow was a timber structure which was sent to Malta in the 1920s to familiarize Maltese prospective emigrants to Australia with typical structures that they would probably find in Australia. This is it the state of the structure at the moment and um, again for this we really desperately need to get some funds to finish off the works we got an initial amount from a sponsor um, Melita Foundation but they're about to run out and there's a long way to go still this is the chapel that I just said we just signed a guardianship deed to restore it's on the out it's located on the outskirts of Rabat it's a very beautiful location and it is has like I said I think it's been years we had been years lobbying to look after this chapel and we've finally been given the thing I just want to show you a clip of this is the entrance to this chapel which i took a few weeks ago just to show the state of the chapel hold on oh sorry hold on hold on there So that uh, this is the chapel from the outside. So as you can see, it desperately needs some attention. This is was the planning authority site notice, which has been there for four years and has disappeared now. But anyway, this is the meeting we had with the superintendent of cultural heritage to sign the deed last week. These are just photographs of the chapel internally to show the state it dates back to the early 15th century and is in a pretty awful state okay i'm coming to to the end of the talk and i just wanted to give you a bit of a a more personal perspective of din what din means to me i Put in this thing into this chat, into this AI chat. Um, what can young people's memories of historic buildings affect them mentally if the buildings disappear? Because I find that when I'm pitching for funds to restore these buildings, very often the younger people, generation, are not really that aware of the importance of these historic buildings. However, I'm sure that in their subconscious or mind or they are not really aware of the importance that these old buildings have and the fabric of these old buildings has and the effect it has on them until possibly they would disappear so anyway and there's this 
thing which is called place attachment. So research does, in fact, suggest that it would affect your mental health if you see that there's no identity in a personal identity or something you can't connect to with the past. So if there's a, a dis disconnection and a, a lack of a sense of belonging th through, I mean, and the buildings do serve, definitely do serve the fabric of the buildings, even visually and spatially do serve as an, uh, an experience to impose this um, sense of place and belonging. So I thought that was very important also to use in uh, my pitch for funds and I this is the sort of thing that I like, tell the younger generation like is this how do you want to end up you know with no collective memory of the past and where we came from where we belong what came before us our ancestors and so on which led me to this if you put in, if you Google House of, you're going to start getting House of Fraser, House of Dragon, House of whatever. However, if you then put in House of K, C-H-K, you get all these sites, multi-sites popping up. House of Character, House of Character for sale. And it is one of those things that when the term House of Character was first coined and marketed by estate agents, so a few well so now probably some decades ago i was really upset and appalled by the enthusiastic reception that it received it was to me it was offensive as an architect and i think it should be so to any self-respecting architect for the simple reason that a house of character doesn't have to be constructed before a certain date or before the establishment of the planning authority there are many beautiful contemporary buildings and houses with plenty of character. So I found this uh, uh, quite upsetting. But one thing is very clear about this use of this house of character, that it was in a way an unconscious, but definitely an indisputable admission and confirmation that all is not well with our built environment and that we should be looking to our buildings to connect us to a time when civic pride was a concept to be cast in stone. So this was, these are typical things which pop up when you're looking at images for houses of character. And uh, this was uh, just a quote from Alan de Botton's book, Architecture of Happiness, it said that we can condemn the gnomes while respecting the longings which inspired them. And again, I, I these gnomes are the notion of gnomes take us into a world of wonder or fantasy imagination it's magical and they're often gnomes are depicted as peaceful gentle creatures with a strong sense of community and living in harmony with nature so and they're also always depicted as living in these beautifully crafted um, homes with intricate details and carvings made of natural materials anyway buildings that i would say reflected their cultural if you want to say that their values and these longings for which like i would say are for pride in their work and in fact when renzo piano came to malta and he started to give talks about his project his main thing was that it was about civic pride, that he wanted to make people proud of Valletta once again. Okay, he gave the, the, the most important site and building and probably the most beautiful building, contemporary building in Malta too, as a parliament building. So, But he was really aware about this civic pride issue, which was sorely lacking in uh, Malta and more specifically possibly in our capital city and as your friends of Valletta I thought it was quite appropriate anyway the 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 project was very beautifully crafted both materially and spatially architecture and even from an urban design point of view and uh, the use of also of Maltese stone 
So I, this, I think, had a big effect on civil, our, at least, on, at least on mine anyway, civil, civic pride, and I think that what Din Halwa is up to is all about civic pride, and um, that's why I'm very happy to be here, and in fact, because it is so meaningful and important for Malta, it's not that difficult to do actually and devote the time for this effort. Well, that's it. And Patrick, thank you very Patrick, much yeah. indeed. That was I most know. interesting. And <laughs> one can see exactly what the important things are that you are restoring and saving. It really is quite incredible. I haven't been to a lot of those and I, I, I think that's a thing we've all got to do. But are there any questions anybody would like to ask? David, can you look after that for me? Um, I am. And at the moment, there isn't a question, but I do have a question. Sorry, Peter Brinsden. Peter Brinsden would like to tell you. Um, P Patrick, have you stopped sharing, by the way? Oh, hold on. If you don't mind. Thank you ever so much. That's, there you are. that's way we can. That way. OK. So, Peter Brinsden, would you like to ask a question? Uh, thank you, Patrick. That was astonishingly good, and your presentation, brilliant. Um, thank you. You didn't mention some of the prehistoric sites, which are my particular interest, uh -huh. things like the Kartras, Agakim and Narya and Tarshien and so on. And you also didn't mention, I visited last year, Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip's house that I understand um, uh, Din Al Halwa is going to restore. Um, they were talking. No, about I'm sorry. Some somebody's restoring it. Maybe it's not Din Al Halwa. It's, it's not Din Al Halwa. It's I think it's Heritage Malta. Okay. Um, which is a state organize it well it's a sort of it's a state organization really state and the same same for the prehistoric sites. and also the prehistoric sites they were run by heritage malta i wasn't sure where the dividing line was anyway we certainly wouldn't have the resources to manage properties like that yeah. it's, i mean they are huge property i mean they have tons of visitors they do very well yeah. and um obviously they're they're part of a complex of world heritage sites including the hypogeum yeah. which is unique and um no they're, they're run by heritage malta um peter borch bartolo you have a question Hi. yes patrick thanks for that presentation it's been really good and and it sort of takes me back quite a few years when i was at at school and you know we were encouraged to to support in large helva but um, I mean, obviously, a lot of your discussion was about preserving what we have and looking at the heritage. Now, in, in Shamshir, for example, there's a there's there's a bit of an uproar, I think, recently with um, the proposal to build some big... Yes, at Mistra. At, well, not just Mistra, but even on the very top of... Yes, of, no, that's on, on, on the top. I mean, where the Mistra village was. Yeah, where, where, where the cart rats are. Yeah. Now, I believe that application has been sort of, you know, sent back or whatever, maybe put in su into suspension. The problem is that we know very well that those applications tend to come back. And you will find that obviously somebody will have um, something to say about that, um, you know, in, in various circles. Now, is there a plan for, say, Dean Artelva to protect such areas because you know we, we keep yes. on using these these areas of well natural beauty um historical areas and such like yes well first of all we were one of the objectors to that project and if it does go through it is a monstrosity yeah. it will be 13 stories high up on the top of overlooking shamshia and I don't think people realize how bad it will look. And when I tell people how bad, I, I use, I don't know if you know the Fort Cambridge building. In yes, yes, yes. It will be as big as that. Yeah. Up there on the top. I mean, the residents have 
um, objected to, and they have they are being quite proactive and they are helping out. But yes, definitely, I think it's an atrocious project. I mean, if it goes through, how how In can fact, how we can... we had we had applied to stop it, we appealed against it, and there was an emergency order issued to stop it. Because they kept on going, despite the fact that there was an appeal against it. They can do that. It's at their own risk. But then, I mean, why, you know, once they start to commit the site, I mean, it's just terrible. Yeah. I mean, there were quite a few issues with the actual ownership of the site and also with the, um, as you say, with the, you know, the height of the building and all the services and such like. But obviously, it's destroying an area which is near enough unique in Malta. Yeah. And it's very prominent. And when you're driving up to Meleha, I mean, yeah. it would be like a huge monster overlooking the valley. I mean, I mean, we're not against development per se, but I mean, it, you, this is not just a, a small, I mean, it's a huge development which will impinge on the countryside and on yes. a huge area because it will be visible from you everywhere. Yes. Besides yes. the fact, that, I mean, besides all the other problems it will create of traffic, mm. you know, parking, I mean, the roads cannot take that, the infrastructure, the drainage system. Yeah. I mean, we're not prepared for all that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Thanks for that. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Patrick, could I just ask a question? Sure. Um, myself, if you don't mind, well done for a tremendous talk. And I'm really glad that you've agreed to record, have this talk recorded. So it'll be up on our website and we'll share the link with people. So your talk will have okay. ongoing effect okay. for, for, you know, beyond today. Um, practical things, practical things. You rely very much on sponsorship and on fundraising. And that includes on your membership. Could you, for the, uh, as an update, you had mentioned that you were a life member before you became the president of uh, Dean mm -hmm. Martelwa. Could you just update the audience, please? What is the current annual subscription and life membership? Oh, I'd have to look online, but it, it is not, I mean, to be honest, it was a, uh, an issue I had this morning because I thought that the it's not, I mean, the, we send out the Vigilo magazines twice a year to all our members. And it's a big job because, I mean, these, these magazines are just brought in. We get about 8,000 of them brought to the office. And the, the work involved with sending them and the publication of them, which costs thousands to publish that magazine. I mean, it's a good quality magazine. So it is quite an expensive thing to do and we really need to increase the <laughs> we need to increase the membership cost to i mean hold on so sorry about that the light's gone so uh, so on, do you have an on. idea of what it's life membership at the moment the life membership I think it was, no i'd have to check okay i'll I check online remember, I'm, but it's I'm, all I'm, online yeah i will have a look so i would certainly recommend to all our members Attending mm. here today, I think it, the, some members, everyone to do not. The yearly here. membership is about twenty-five euros only. I mean, yeah. so, so um, yeah. I'd certainly advocate everyone listening here today. If you're not yet a member, seriously, please consider it for the sake of Malta's heritage. You've seen the work that Patrick and Dina Telwa are doing. Um, absolutely, it needs our support. Anne Shikluna, question from Anne. Please unmute yourself, Anne. Yes, thank you very much, David. Um, a couple of th things. Um, first of all, perhaps if um, Patrick will let us have details of membership, I can put a, put a note in the next Melita, copy of Melita, so okay. that members can have a look at that. I think I send about 30 euros a year to you, um, but that, that hopefully that covers it. The other thing I would like to say is... Hey, I'm really glad that I came to that talk at Dinat Helwa in Valletta and met you, Patrick, because you. uh, you've given us a superb talk and it's really been so interesting for me. So thank you very much personally from me. Thank you. Um, Patrick, could I come in on that and follow that? You've given us a talk from the very top, as it were, from the, as the president. We have previously had a talk by Paolo Ferrelli, who okay. I know very well, talking about him, see the Bastion Cemetery. 
Yeah. Um, you've highlighted some of the other sites with wardens, like I think Mark Vellat, Winyaport. Martin, Martin. And Martin, yes, uh... who I do not know. Could I ask you, please, to contact uh, your wardens, those who you know are very good at public speaking and have good presentations, and put them in touch with Anshi Luna so sure. that they could please, we can act as a platform for future talks. We would sure, be absolutely sure. delighted to do that. If you could do the connecting, please. I will, yes, no problem at all. We'd I'll be delighted that. to help in this way. Yes. Thank you. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank um, you, Graham. I'd just like to close and say uh, we're so pleased. I think so many people will be enjoying this, and the suggestions both by Anne and David will be very welcome for possible other talks. But one of the things I would just like to tell the members that the, the next talk is on July the 1st. Um, Chichester is very keen to uh, establish ecclesiastical links with the cathedrals in Malta with Chichester. And I'm delighted to say that when we went to Malta, Anne and I spoke to the dean, certainly at the Anglican Cathedral, David Wright, and he is going to give us a talk on the 1st of July at 7 p.m. on aspects of the history of St. Paul's Anglican Cathedral in Valletta. So that should also be very interesting. Thank you. you could Patrick, send me the link I think to... cheers all round from all of us here today for an excellent Thank you. talk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, David. Thank God you, Patrick. You. Good evening to everyone. Good evening, and thank you very much for coming. Um, Graham, um, over to you to end the meeting. Well, I don't really have anything else to say other than thank you all the members for attending, and I hope they found it as interesting as I have. And from what we're saying, we hope that there will be some more talks from Dinnut Helwer on other on specific buildings rather than just the overall, which Patrick has brilliantly outlined for us. So thank you very much. Okay. We look Graham, forward to I seeing you in subsequent on, talks. Oh, sorry. I just looked on the website for Dinnut uh, Helwer and the individual life membership is 250 euros per lifetime. Uh, which is ten, uh, only 10 times the uh, individual membership. But um, I, I'm, having just gone online here, I'm just going to join Dino. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Thank anyway, you, Richard. For a yearly one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Well done, Wish Richard. you good night. Okay. Good, good night. night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night Bye. and God bless. Bye. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Pat. Good night.